is your name? My name is Beatrice. Yeah. Where do you come from? I come from Okere Parish. <laughs> The village of Okere Momkok was in ruins after more than a decade of war in northern Uganda. Now, just outside Ojok Okelo's house, pupils at the early childhood center are noisily starting with their break time and the market is cluttering into life, as is the local craft brewery, as what has become Okere City begins a new day. Okere oi! Okere oi! Okere is a parish in Adwari sub-county Otuke district in Lango, one of the dialects in northern Uganda. Okere Momkok can be loosely translated to mean that a baby shouldn't cry or a baby who doesn't cry. If a baby isn't crying, then it's smiling. The name of their village forms the basis of their story because a smile is synonymous with hope, love, compassion, care, sharing, happiness, and giving. Okere is behind an ambitious project to transform the destroyed village of 4,000 people into a thriving and sustainable town. Okere city began in January 2019. Its 200 hectares feature a land, a health clinic, a village bank, and a community hall that also serves as a cinema, a church, and a nightclub. Electricity is available to all, generated from solar energy, a reality in the region. And far from the many outbreaks of cholera, which were rampant years ago, there is now clean water from a borehole. Pupils at the school pay half their fees in cash and the rest in maize, beans, sugar and firewood. Okada City has a functional adult literacy program which has given a unique opportunity to up to 50 community members, mostly female, to get a chance to learn how to read, write, and hone other important life skills. The child has been happy to drop out because of poverty, sickness, human rights, and some activity at home, like the farming. Yeah. Or uh, one two week. Every Saturday. When some uh, activities yeah, we interrupt any day, like uh, Thursday. Yeah. So why are you having family on the way at the moment? The men say that they're ready all the doctor have time to come and uh, study. Yeah. Do you have any males who have come to study? Yes, we are men. We have about uh, two, Kim jo and Yes. Yeah. So, uh, with this setting, what are some of the opportunities that the people of Okwere have benefited? The benefit is to eradicate the poverty and the ignorance in this uh, area. area. Yeah. Learning is a lifelong process. It never ends. And it doesn't matter at what time you start learning something. And they are so committed. I mean, just about a month ago, they, they couldn't write their names. You know, just the basics. 
uh, but right now they can write their names, they can do basic uh, calculations, math and all these things. Later they will tell us you know, what, what they have been able to achieve just uh, within a very short span of running this program. Uh, so if you don't know, Utuke district um, is the most illiterate district in Uganda. In fact, according to Uganda Bureau of Statistics, up to 72% of the adult population in Otuke district uh, did not go beyond primary school. 72%. This is horrendous data. And if you cascade it down to even the gender dimensions of it, up to about 92% of the women you know, in Otuke district you know, did not go beyond uh, primary education. And so that is why for us this program is particularly very, very important. So my name is Samuel Mohino. Uh, I come from Kasese. Yeah, 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 Samuel and Yana and Kasese. Yeah, they have hills. It's not flat like here. <laughs> so I am very happy to be here and I'm very happy to see Mama studying. It is very good. And education is the best thing that you can choose. It comes at any age. And I was impressed by the teacher when he said when the best way of I'm showing us like is, is, is <laughs> yeah, so, so she, she, she just wants to get this, this opportunity has given her new perspectives and she wants to continue getting exposed and learning more, much more. The clinic lets people pay their bills in installments. Okello is funding the project from his own pocket. The London School of Economics graduate and development expert had worked for several international charities and NGOs but grew disillusioned seeing projects fail because, he says, communities were not involved in decisions about their own future. So raw, so authentic. And this is real Africa. And moving forward, we, we can develop and have good cities, but we need to uh, reserve, reserve our authentic socialization processes here. When he returned a few years ago to Okeri yeah. Mamkok, the village he had left as a baby when his civil servant father was killed in the bush wars of the 1980s, he decided to put what he had learned into action. He wanted to create a project that was truly led by the people who lived there. Okere now generates revenue. Every project, from the school to the local bar, can fund itself, something that has been possible because the project is being built not on as a charity, but as a social enterprise. Okay, it is through work and working. Yeah? Oh, when you want to do something, you have to, okay, you have to consult somebody, somebody who is on top of somebody who was there before. Okay. It's like somebody, someone who is a soap keeper before. Yeah, you have to consult how EOC start the, the shop. And we start this shop after we found out there's no shop in the, in the house. That's why we happened to emerge um, as okay sale. And, um, Mm. We brought few things, but after seeing that people are coming to buy, and we we also have to okay keep on doing the store. And mm, on this, sometimes we can even give them on credits. They they, they, they buy some people after on credit they, they okay they bring. Yeah, we do the saving in our boxing club and sometimes we give loans to the people. 
Yes. And on that loan, they, they, they give back it to me no? with the interest. Yes. Okay. On that interest, we keep on no? mm, bringing it with another thing in the club. Okere City pioneers green energy, but its unique selling point is its sheer trees. Once a week, an investment club meets in the community hall. The majority of more than 100 members are women, mostly farmers, but some also run small businesses. Members' financial contributions are carefully recorded before being redistributed as loans to members who need them. When borrowers repay the loan, the cycle continues. This style of banking is particularly important because it's original to Africans. But rural to urban development projects only work if they are created by and include the communities they are working to serve. Together with the community members, they are convicted to make their work to be a bedrock upon which their dreams, hope, and a prosperous future of the village is built. A couple of trees, eucalyptus, remember sustainability. And get yourself a haircut. And remember we use solar. <laughs> Definitely self-sustained. Self, self and who knows, while you are getting your hair cut, catching up with your boys, you buy yourself some, some chicken and take home to the wife. I love the vibe. I love the rawness. I love the reminding of community and how important it is for us to not isolate. Very simple setup, very convenient, easily movable. What else would you want? <laughs> Satisfied customer, as you can see from his smile, a very busy and concentrated barber. Located about 60 kilometers from the northeasterly direction of Lira City, Okere is situated in the center of Otuke district, which is headquartered a further 15 kilometers away. Some villages in the parish are in the borderline with the Choli sub district of Agago. People seated around Mara pots are a common sight. A mix of both traditional rhythms and modern music play in disoriented harmony. Both sides of the road are usually filled to capacity and businesses are even conducted in the middle of the road. There is a common saying in Okere that only the most unlucky, all sinful people die on Sundays. Because if you die on a Sunday, no one mourns you apart from your close family members. People only start mourning you on Monday. Maybe it's just a saying, but what is true is that no burial ceremony has ever conducted in the history of the village on Sunday. Every day, the Okere community remind themselves of their motto, Yamakweka Do, which means a living wind blows. And it isn't just a saying, it's a mantra, one which reminds them that despite the most impossible of odds, they should never stop to seek any things that breathes freshness and a sigh of hope in their lives. Well, before we went for that, we said, let's meet Okere. And like you've just had in that mini documentary, Okere Mumkok means a baby who shouldn't cry, uh, if I may just translate in my own words. And like you've seen, that's smiling and joy. If, you to, if it were a person, uh, that would just summarize what Okere means. But now, with me in studio, I have the founder of a city. Uh, you know, Uganda has been described as one of the most entrepreneurial countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And many people, as CEOs and founders of companies or small firms, never before have I sat next to a founder of an entire city. Donan Ojok Okelo, welcome to CTV. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's phenomenal work that you're doing, what we've just seen there. Yeah, it is. We don't have a choice you don't but to build and elevate our communities. Okay, I love that. And next to you, uh, you have Christopher Okidi, who is the legal advisor of Okere City. Mm. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. I am happy to be in this show today mm -hmm. uh, to talk about uh, what I have seen as a very inspiring model right. for Africa and the entire, and, and particularly our country. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, in your own words, this project is radical, ambitious, and, you know, an, an ambitious way, a, a rural development plan. Those, those are the words that you use, and rightfully, like we have seen. But I want to take you back. Um, many of us um, have dreams, we have aspirations, but at what point, how did you get from dreaming up this thing to bringing it to reality? There wasn't any moment that I ever dreamt of, of starting up the project or the city, right. never. Mm. I went back home after 30 years uh, so I had been away because my father died when I was six months old yeah. and my mother remarried so I stayed with my mom and for some reason you know my mom told me of what happened she was you know they wanted to force her to marry one of my uncles she refused so my father's family abandoned her and um, so I grew up you know as a child knowing that I don't care about my father right. and his family. But you see, uh, as an African man, when you grow up, you become a man, uh, you become a father, you know? You start asking yourself certain fundamental questions, like who am I, where do I belong? And really, these questions you know, struck. Right. And, and, and I knew at that moment that I had to go back home. So I went back to Kerry. I'd lived most of my life in Lira town. But then I was working in Kampala, you know, had, you know, gone to school, studied development from Makerere, and then went to the London School of Economics, studied international development, you know. Then I had about eight years experience working with both national and international NGOs. So I had a bit of money. How long did you work with the, the NGOs uh, before you, you came back? I about eight years. Eight years. Right. Yes. Yeah. So so all this. So I had a bit of money, had network, had knowledge, well equipped. So I went back home. Really, for me, it was just to you know see my other family. You know, get connected to my ancestors. Um, but that first night, I I I I would never forget because it rained, and I slept. I have a stepfather. African fathers. Yeah. I have a, a stepbrother in the village. Yeah. Um, so I slept in his kitchen and it rained in the night and all through the rain I couldn't sleep because the, the roof was leaking. It was a grass thatched hut. And I couldn't reconcile these two worlds that I found myself in. You know, on the other hand, I go for international conferences, I go to work in either in Berlin or London. I in Kampala I stay at a relatively nice home. And then in this so-called home of mine in the village, I can't actually have a good sleep in the night because the roof is leaking. Right. I mean, it, I, mean I, I became so angry with myself that I thought, you know, this was the time I did something for myself, you know, built maybe a good house, you know, have a decent, whenever I come to the village or bring my children to the village. But you see, that wasn't going to be the case. It was never just going to be about my comfort, about what I thought was good for me. Because when we started building these cottages, which were really for me, so what I first did was clear the compound, the bush, so that it's like a wide expanse of land. You know, because I had this imagination of a country home, you know, with that. So, so let, with, let me just take you back a little bit yeah. from that night where you slept and you were not comfortable and you're thinking I must build a better house, mm -hmm. I must do something. Mm -hmm. So then you wake up the next morning and you're planning cottages, a country home for yourself. Yes, yeah. yes. And then that's when you launched into... Yeah, and so this was 2018 yeah. when I came, you know, when I visited my, my brother. 
And um, so we started off then late, that was about August 2018. So towards the end of the year, we had already started, you know, going into 2019. We started, you know, these small cottages clearing the compound, you know. But then I noticed that as we when we cleared the compound and started building these little cottages, many children started coming to play in the compound. Right. But I noticed that this was school time. Right, so meaning that when they come to play in this compound, uh, and, they spend and most it's of school the time, time there, yeah? it means that perhaps they are not going to school. So I talk to them. I'm like, why are you not going to school? They told me, you know, there's no school. I mean, it struck me. So I decided to, you know, go talk to their parents. Most of them relatives, you know, at home, but also expanded widely into the village. And actually, there wasn't a nursery school, and the nearest primary school was about four kilometers. Perhaps and that is when we just decided to organize a community meeting and we decided to start up an early childhood development center and the house that a cottage that I was building as my rest house perhaps in the compound was just uh, instantaneously turned. In, into, into a classroom. Into a classroom. Uh, yes. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd like to first bring in your legal advisor here. When did you first learn about the dream of Okere City? Yeah, uh, first of all, I am not even ad advising Okere City by accident. <laughs> uh, Ojok is first of all my friend. Yeah. And secondly, Okere is also just nine miles away from my own village, Patong, yeah. where the CJ, the Chief Justice, comes from. And um, that, is, that is also how I get to understand Okere properly. So Ojok told me about his dream. And knowing what Okere is, because when I am going to the village, I actually pass from Okere. And you may also want to know that Okere, is, uh, let me say Otuke district, is the host of Balonyo where the massacre happened. You see? So the effects of conflict can actually be seen in the entire Otuke district. Let me say just the entire northern Uganda. Right. So when he came up with the idea, which I got to learn about in 2019, I really got excited and uh, I had to force myself to be very close <laughs> to him <laughs> because uh, the whole idea, you know, we sometimes we have a lot of dreams, even me, myself, I could have wanted to establish something like Okere City, mm. but you know, sometimes people only dream and, uh, and sto a lot of things die in dreams. Right. They are not put in action. And when... I saw him implement his in action. Then I said, aha, uh -huh. I think finally we have someone to inspire us. All we need to do is to be clear, uh, to be very near, to monitor the process, and, and then first of all generate ideas. So for me, that is how I got to know about, about Okere City. And I actually, in fact, I have become a very strong ambassador <laughs> for this whole project. Yeah. Because this project, to me, why I found, you, I, don't, I don't only do legal advice. Uh, the legal advice I give is based on my understanding of the project yeah. and where it has to go. Mm -hmm. You've had conflict in Northern Uganda where people, where there are a lot of NGOs uh, that created a lot of dependency, people resigned from development, and everywhere people are talking about government to Yambe. Yeah. But you see, Okere is bringing in a model to tell you that, you see, uh, at the end of it all, it is us, it is we the people who can be the change we want to be. Like Obama said, we are actually the people we are waiting for. Yeah. So to see Ojok mobilize his community on the project and see, as we watch from the documentary, see where Okere now is, uh, is a very big sign of hope that uh, better things are even to, uh, are yet to come. And, and we'll be looking at those yeah. better things which are to come. Yeah, but the most important thing is yeah. the philosophical change, the yeah. mindset change that now people think they really need, that if we are to change our societies, it is us and nobody. Right. And, um, you know, he, he, the story kind of like tells itself uh, and even how he, he rolls it out. There's mm. one thing that led to another. It's almost mm. so systematic. Yeah. Um, so when you started, when you saw the children 
who were evidently not going to school. You thought, I need to do something. I need to talk to their parents. So what was that first step you, what you did? Did you go to maybe a local counselor? Did you talk to some friends to help you mobilize? Take us through that. Yes. So at the very beginning, I knew that to make this idea come to fruition, it, a, had, it would not have to be about me. It had to be about the community. Right. And then what would I have to do to make sure that I gained the community's trust and confidence? And I knew that if this worked, then there would be the most important currency you know, that would fuel the operations and the success of this project. And this is also informed by the fact that I'd worked on big programs and projects before. And all the time, I was the expert. I was the guy who knew, you know, to tell the communities what to do. This time, I was going to take a back seat and listen and perhaps be a student again. And true to that, I did. So I talked to the parents. Why aren't they going to school? This, this, and this. What should we do? Let's come together in a community meeting. Discuss. You have your local leaders. You have your religious leaders here. I'm all ears. And then they come up with a suggestion. How about we start up uh, an early childhood development program? I'm like, sounds good. Yeah. I have a house. And I can also pay the salary for a teacher. But what about you? What are you going to do? We are going to bring firewood. We are going to bring beans, posho, sugar. And, and, we, and we start, and I can tell you, we started with eight kids in August of 2019. Mm -hmm. And by December of 2019, there were already 120 kids in class. This was massive. And the parents were super, super excited. And, and so everything just kept growing like that. And when the parents now came and formed themselves together as a collective, as a group, they started having discussions amongst themselves. I mean, we've already come up together as parents of these kids. How about we also start village savings and loan activities? So that is how they came and started their loan and lending and saving activities. So in, during one of my trips, I came on a Friday and I arrived at about 4 p.m. I found very many people, you know, sitting, you know, with a box. I told them, so what exactly are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then they told me, you know, we decided we set up 3 p.m. every Friday as the day we meet to lend and save money amongst ourselves. And just between September, between, um, yes, yeah, September of 2019, when they started these really small operations, until December, they had saved up to 3.5 million shillings. And this was the biggest savings any group in the village had, had collected. Had. Well, in, the, in, in the, a, in the, because it wasn't a full circle. Usually yeah. it's January to December. Yeah. This was, you know, from September to December. Okay. And they just well, couldn't well, We're going that. to come back to all those miracles that are happening in Okere City. When we go, we're going for a very short break. We'll be right back and we'll hear much more uh, that Ojok has to unpack for us. on a journey to realize our full potential we all need expanded minds and limitless possibilities we need to be accurately informed ctv is your growth partner with reliable in-depth news we tell the story from all perspectives we bring you the story in real time Catch our comprehensive daily bulletins in Juba Egorodie at 7 p.m. and p.m. edition at 9 p.m. CTV. Don't blink. The big debate is back. Bigger, bolder, reloaded. Whether it is securing your future, holding fast to the people power, or the promise of a one Uganda, one thing is certain, the 
big debate is on. So no, why not to respect the memories of Dr. Scottis? We have already addressed the issue of increment. How many people have ever been convicted? Okay. There's a way that the politics plays in cabinet. So okay. now why are they asking for the oh. statement? <laughs> Follow mainstream conversations on current affairs and leading policy debates in Uganda. It is in our interest to handle arrested people very nicely. Right here on The Big Debate. Let me, let me find out. Right. No, I, I was wet. Right. I was I was, I was wet. Wet. It's a hard hitting talk show on development issues in the political and social economic arena. Discussions that inform policy and trigger high level dialogue. Now showing on CTV. Don't blink. CTV is now on Star Time. You can now catch all your favorite programs, our daily comprehensive news bulletins, and so much more on Star Time's channel number 248. Stay tuned for a world of endless possibilities. CTV, don't blink. Love sports? We do too. We got you covered. The Sports Dish, your daily lunchtime sports show that serves the intrigue, breaks down the act, and gives you an in-depth analysis of the odds. Who's going up? Who's going down? Catch all the thrilling action right here on The Sports Dish with Clive Chazé. Coming soon on CTV. Don't blink. Welcome back from that short break and thank you for keeping it CTV. You're watching The Impact, a show that we bring you that shows, like the name suggests, the impact that is happening in our communities. And today we have a very rare privilege of hosting someone who has founded an entire city, that is Okere City. And if you missed the first segment or if you watched the first segment, you saw that this city is not just about people who are in Otuke district, but it's actually in its, an international city, even attracting people and citizens who are outside of Okere. Do you have a name for people from Okere City? Never thought about yeah, it. Yeah, never thought about it. Okay, maybe we can form one right yeah. now. And then we have Okerians. <laughs> okay, so I would love to be a citizen of Okere as well. Thank you. I don't know what it would take. So before we went for a break, you were telling us about um, how it was important for you to work with the local community, the politicians. I mean, uh, you demonstrated to us how you are a very focused man when you did your studies and did your masters and then you started working, um, you were able to save so much money. Uh, for people who've been following the story of Okere, we know that you've invested so much of your personal money into that. But then I also understand it might take a lot more than individual will to go and transform the people. If you can tell us something about that, especially for someone who might be thinking of doing the same um, in, in rural development in any other part of this world. Yeah, so I mean the process of building a resilient community, let's just talk about a resilient community. Perhaps the city is uh, blown out of proportion, <laughs> right? But right. talking about building a resilient community, it's it can never be just about the individual effort or the visionary, in this case, my case, in my, myself, you know, picking up the candle and going with it. it. It has to be much more than that. It has to be about the ordinary people. Do you build their capacities? Do you work so hard to make sure that they understand this vision and then can carry on with it even when I fall and die now? What about the local leaders? These are very important important veins that keep the heart of a community beating, you know, because when there are problems, these are people, we go to them. But also for the local leaders in Okere particularly, and we are talking about LC1, LC2, the parish development chiefs, you know, these, are, these people are most important to me, perhaps more than the president, perhaps more than the LC5 chairperson. Of Otuke because they are with the community. They understand what we are doing. And so to be able to build a kind of 
a, a thriving and successful community that we have to build, first of all, they must understand the vision. And secondly, they must have the knowledge and the skills and the capabilities to lead the local people into the right directions. Right. And that is why you know, we started this Okere Leadership uh, Laboratory, which is basically about incubating you know, this new breed of local political and community leaders to kind of understand you know, that this little village could actually become London. Right. But you see, you are, you are not going to teleport them, you know, to that reality. You must let them start seeing it now and working with them, let, letting them see the bigger picture, involving them at every decision-making level, right? And then not only listening to their decisions and whatever their ideas, but actually implementing it and, and so that they see that their su suggestions are coming into into fruition and this is really what we do but we also are generally interested in making them emerge as a new breed of very successful local leaders we want to make them to understand what the constitution is what their roles are as local leaders because you know ironically whilst the village chief or the lc1 chairperson is the most important political leader in this country Come to think about it, like if you needed a passport, you would have to somehow get a letter from the LC1. From the LC1. If you, you know, this very, but you see, sometimes we don't think about it critically, but they're actually very important. But you see, that mistake is being made even at the highest, highest level yeah. of government, because then a lot of investments are put into developing the capacities of perhaps LC3 chairperson, like LC3 and above. These guys at the, the, el the parish, you know, the, the villages, they are forgotten. You know, nobody even tries to make them understand what their roles could be. And now with the parish development model, the government actually finds itself in quite a, a box. Uh, 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 yeah, because, because they, they haven't supplied the paper at the You forgot the these guys. Yeah. You forgot, you, they, by the way, do you know that LC1 and LC2, they're sh supposed to be elected after every five years? Do you know that in the past 20 years, only one election have been held? And, and that really <laughs> highlights a, a very key point. But I want to bring in yeah. um, Christopher in this right now. Before, yeah. earlier on, you had told us, once he shared his vision, yeah. you said you're going to tie on him. I mean, he was already mm. your friend. Mm, yeah. uh, but, um, and he has already hinted on the so many things that have happened ever since. Mm. I mean, this vision has had exponential growth that you're mm. transforming very mm. fast. Mm. In your view, what would you say is helping this community to transform itself mm. very quickly and yet mm. they're using the resources that they've always had? Mm. Yeah, uh, one thing is, for me, I am, before I became a lawyer, I was also a development worker. And by the way, my first, very first degree is also development studies and, uh, and particularly rural development. So you make and a very good yes, combination. And, and me, by the way, let me tell you, one thing I believe, I, I am one person who always believes that, first of all, people should have it in their mind that the primary actors in their own development is them. And for me, I think the success of Okeresity is realizing that. Realizing that let people be at the center of development. Because you, you don't just drag along people <laughs> with the development. If, if people are at the center of development, uh, it, will, it will save you a lot. You were talking about funding and what. The biggest resource you actually need in any development project is the people. When they accept a project and understand it, they will, and, and they own it, you know, ownership. And as opposed to trust, inclusion, by the, the way, <laughs> because when you're just yeah? including them, yeah. then that is a different thing. But when they own it, it is also different. Yeah. So when they own it, uh, they will be willing to provide all the resources required. So that particular aspect is actually what works. And it is not working only in Okere. Mm. I want you to look at, um, there's a community called Lazua in Iran. Yeah. In Iran. Even in South Africa, there is a chiefdom called Bafokeng. 
you probably may have heard of the Welsh development model where the Welsh even started their own Welsh development bank. Anokere, by the way, has a village bank, you see? Yeah. Which is, of course, like it started, as he explained, it started as a SACO, saving group, local economic development group, SACO, and now it is becoming a bank and it will exponentially uh, grow. So that is the reason why I think I am so passionate about Okere. Because and, and in Uganda, girl, yeah. in Uganda, let me tell you, you may have probably heard everywhere, when you, you journalists know, when you give a microphone to everyone, the first thing they are going to say, government to yambe. How do you say it in law? Gamente okonya. Gamente mirokonywa. That government to yambe. But you know but the, the role. government should help But you us, see, yeah. the role of government is just to provide public goods, rule of law, security, what and what, these other things, it is the role of the community. Okay, now, now that the community has mm. taken this and, and you've highlighted for mm. us this miracle of when they started their own savings group and they were able to raise, I call it a miracle, 3.5 million shillings. Mm. Now, take us to the vision, the future of Okere, because we've seen all these sports teams developing, we've seen a music festival, I mm. mean, it's a lot of laughter and joy in this camp or this city you said we're overrating it by calling it a city, but still is, mm. that used to be a place of a lot of sadness and joy when people were driven out because of the war, but it's now, the story is changing. So if we are to cast a vision, um, how should we expect Okere City to look like? Well, so um, in 2030, the world is going to sit down and take stock of what could have been achieved with the sustainable development goals right. and i already see that there will be a lot of failures one because of the covid19 pandemic mm -hmm. you know we've been taken aback the war in ukraine yeah. you no know, very many things but okara city shall be the guiding star for the world in 2030 we are going to make sure that the 90%, 98% of the children that weren't going to school in 2020, we are going to turn that around and make sure that 98% of the children in Okere City are now going to school. We are going to make sure that we turn the HIV and AIDS infection rates in Okere, which at this particular moment is about 26%. We want to reduce that to under five percent. We are going to make sure that the adult illiteracy rate, which at the moment is 72 percent, that it is drastically slashed to under 30 percent. We could talk about all this data and all these statistics, but ultimately we want to make sure that Okere is indeed a sustainable and a thriving city. Maybe we are not be going to be having no super flying aeroplanes just like it was in Wakanda which by the way contributed a little bit to this imagination of a community that we need yeah but I know for a fact that this people in Okara will be one hell of a excited batch because life will be good Right, and, and we've already seen that in the, in the short time that you have started this dream. You talk about sustainability and a sustainable community, and I understand that one of the things that you're doing um, is to ensure that people have solar electricity. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Um, have you been very intentional on the kind of solar that you use? Because from what we've seen, and maybe the capacity of the sun that we have, we tend to have very weak solar, but you now have a solar system that is powering a, health commun a community health center. Yes. I mean, so thanks to nature, we have abundance of sunshine. Right. You know, more than uh, about, I think, 10 hours of sunshine every day you know and it can be super hot at like between 28 to 35 and degrees and it has got hotter you know? right now so yes um well but instead of cry about how hot the place is how about we actually tap this resource into something we could use to power transformation in the village 
Okara village itself is about uh, 10 kilometers away from the grid, from the power, like the power grid. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, uh, tapping into that and bringing, uh, lining poles to Okara would be quite an uh, expensive undertaking, which we are obviously not going to invest in. But we have the sun. And, um, you know, I mean, over the, over the two years, energy in terms of the solar has been quite instrumental. And we actually now know that, okay, when you run to downtown to the market, there are very many solar products. Yeah. But then there are actually also companies that invest in genuine and authentic you know, solar products. And they, oh, there are also like, ad people who can advise you know, and give you best insights on which products to use. And this is the route that we've taken. Of course, at the moment, we still generate, you know, very little enough to do basic lighting, um, maybe run small businesses, but not do industrial production, which is the future we are looking at. Yeah. So in the future, we want to, you know, set up green industries, you know, carry, right? And one of the industries that or the, the production chains that we are going to set up is the the shea butter so shea butter shea trees grow naturally in okere thanks to the sun and to our rocky soils it actually favor the the, the, the growth of shea trees and shea trees by the way only grows in 21 African, uh, African countries, countries. Yeah. and we are lucky that Okere city is located within that belt you know where the trees grow and so over the years you know we want to set up a shea butter production facility and of course powered by solar we also want to put up irrigation systems you know because the place is uh, you know receives very little rain and so we need solar energy to kind of power all these productive activities right um, you talked about the irrigation system I understand that you started something on 50 acres how is it going right now yes yeah, so the irrigation it we do not have an irrigation project yet at the moment yeah. but it's it's a dream you know that we have that we set up a community irrigation scheme and this is based from the israel model of setting up small-scale irrigation community which irrigation uses produce. less water instead yeah, of wasting that yeah. uses less water but also that gives you know community not just one rural capitalist so to speak to produce you know but basically bring communities so have 50 acres give each household you know a little chunk you know, so, so that they can be productively engaged all throughout the year. Right. Yeah. Um, and still, you know, talking sustainability, uh, because with um, the sheer, saving sheer trees, um, that's a campaign that you've been starting, because sheer trees, if our viewers can understand, that's the vibranium that you have. Uh, like, you know, if we are to equate it to what was um, in Wakanda, the sheer trees are the Wakanda, or the, the, the vibranium, rather, of um, Okere City. Um, the discussions that you're having with the community to save that, because I understand there are people who are making money um, selling charcoal. So uh, what conversations are you having with that community to say, okay, we do have the charcoal, but we need to, to save this vibranium of ours, quote-unquote? Yeah, so I can tell you so what, I, what I did. Uh, so during the lockdown, one day I was, you know, taking a siesta under a shear tree, which is in my compound. A huge one, the leathery leaves, you know, were blowing with the directions of the wind, and it was fruiting. And I looked at this tree, and I was like, holy goodness why aren't we you know tapping from this from this resource why aren't we using it and i got so interested and i started reading about the, the shea butter the shea trees and i mean the global share value is like 1.2 billion us dollars and it is projected that in the next two years that's okay. 2024 Twen in 2025 actually it's yeah. going to be about five billion dollars now very few businesses of grow at this scale right and 
a Google search will show you everything about Sheabata, but it will be West African. They will show you how it's you know, elevating communities yeah. in Ghana. It will tell you how you know you know these social enterprises in West Africa are launching Sheabata products. You know uh, across and then the world. No mention no, of no Uganda. Mention, no <laughs> mention of, of 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 the Ugandan share. Yeah. And by the way, the Ugandan share. Exactly. Shea butter. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's but the when you say it's the pearl, what do the, you mean? The headquarter of shea butter. Mm. But everyone knows that uh, the highest concentration of shea butter trees is actually in Uganda. Yes. And even even with all the conflicts we've had that had diverse, that devastated the environment, there is still a lot of shea butter, which is being preserved in Okere. And by the way, Okere has a, a climate change project because the shea butter is actually pegged to climate change because the trees are important. And one of the, one of, in the trip, when you saw in the documentary, one of the things I was doing, I was actually training community leaders, LC3 councillors, LC1, LC2, on the legal and policy framework of local level climate action. So that is the first step Okere has taken to preserve the environment, but also uh, to preserve, in fact, shooting, they say shooting a bird, <laughs> two birds, two birds with one stone. stone. I feel like first you're, of you're all, shooting so as the many economic, birds. Yeah, yeah, looking at the economic value of shea yeah. butter, but also the, the duty we all have to protect our environment. Right. Yes. yes. And and so 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 about the share tree. So so then what happened is we you know we really like after noticing that this resource could is indeed our vibranium mm -hmm. then the people will really have to understand what this is beyond what they thought it is or it was. So initially in northern Uganda, we eat the shea fruits. Um, we play with the shea nuts, mm. like you know, like the kids yeah, when like, we are like playing. Duru. We play, yeah, yeah we duru. play with the shea nuts, right? And yeah. um, and and so we know that the, we make shea butter for the edible shea butter. Yeah, and, so and there's, that's the, there's an interesting aspect that you're doing now that you're producing um, en masse. You've tried to preserve the local way of producing shea butter instead of you know trying to go the industrial way as as many of us are jumping to yeah I th yeah i think for cultural purposes and also i mean the edible so you can make shea butter in in many ways so we yeah. try to do both the the traditionally you know to preserve the culture but also to retain its edible you know functions but of course also so now to to make the people see the bigger picture i come to kampala i go to shop right then all these fancy supermarkets, I buy the share butter products on their stalls and I do not remove the price tag. So I go for a community meeting and I tell them, how much do you think this share butter is? And most of the time they will say 5,000 or 10,000, some could say 15. And then I show them what actually the real price is and it is 65,000, it is 50,000. And they can't believe it. That's something so small. Yeah. could be so expensive and, so and i tell them yet even this, dilute not very organic. yeah not even organic yeah so i tell them this is what we have and this is why we must never cut down any of these trees and for people in okere they have even made a commitment a pledge to themselves that none of them or their children will ever cut a share tree and true to that for the past two years the cases of people cutting share trees are from the other villages, not from Okere. And this really gives me hope because, you know, we have lots of young share trees coming up and we're also going to plant more share trees. We are going to rewild the community with share trees. And I'm very sure this will really be our vibranium. Yeah, I think it's And by the way, if you come for, uh, to Okere for a visit, you'll also, of course, get a share butter massage, which is you know, kind of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. One of yeah. the experiences that we treat our guests. Yeah, and the thing that you're talking about. And by as, the way, as we just for your information, yeah. you can see how my skin is, is very is, is glowing. glowing. Because, <laughs> it's just because, because of the massage. Okay. Yeah. Of course, people that, who know me before, yeah. people who know me before knew I used to have a very dry skin. 
Okay, so we thank Okere City Okere for what they're doing. Shia and um, <laughs> just as we wind up, one of the things mm. I understand that you're doing is you want Okere to be an education center, yeah. not just for people in Uganda, but the rest of Africa and internationally. Mm. Yes. Um, if you can just, in closing, um, mm. because uh, unfortunately we are running out of time, yet we have so much to talk about and to learn about Okere Vamkom. So uh, that dream to make Okere the international learning center, if you can just tell us very briefly yeah. about it. Yeah, so we don't want it just to be an international learning center. We want Okere City to be an experience of mm. a lifetime. So we want to create it as a destination for not only knowledge mm -hmm. and learning, but also shared, sharing authentic and cultural experiences. And that is why, you know, we have to make this community investment uh, practices on the ground. We want people, you know, to come to Okere and see for themselves what can be done with the most minimal of resources but you know working and engaging with the community because at the end of the day when okere has become a successful village okay my dream as the visionary is to make sure that across the entire african continent okere city is replicated mm. everywhere what do you want people take away yeah, from okere city yeah for me uh, one thing is that okere city is first of all the first experimentation into an Afrofuturistic city. Because uh, cities in Africa are becoming very depressing. You know, like those days, uh, the people who plan these cities plan such that when you look up, you look at inspiration. Hills had Namirembe Hill and what. So, Okere City should now pioneer new, uh, an Afrocentric urbanization model for Africa that uh, Africa can develop, but also with their positive aspects of their culture intact. And that is why when you go to Okere City, you actually see people doing Lukeme, songs that the war had made, the, the kind of instruments that nearly disappeared in war. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, Africa should develop. We don't mind Africa developing into an advanced city, but when it develops with that advancement, culture and also the fact that we own the cities and we feel part of it for me i think that is empowering other than that cities can become very depressing by the way <laughs> yeah. right mm. well very sadly we've come to the end of this show i am very inspired i hope you are too you've just had it uh, from the people who are running okere city which is in otuke district and by the way, this was cut from uh, Lira District uh, several years back. Um, what I learned from this is creating solutions, local solutions for local communities. We're not going to say for local problems because every community has a problem, but for local challenges, working with people, you might call it Ubuntuism, and having culture at the heart of it. I'm looking forward to my trip to Ukere. I hope you are too. Well, that's been for Impact Today. Um, stay tuned to CTV, and we have more programming lined up for you. I've been your host, Amelia Martha Nashtimbo. Goodbye. <laughs>